Welcome back to Jacques in the Garden. Today, you might be guessing, we are going to be planting tomatoes and we're gonna be planting indeterminate tomatoes in ground in this bed. So let's go over all the details of what I'm doing, how I prep this area, and the different varieties that I'm growing here, which are gonna actually end up being 15 different tomato varieties. This bed here is actually somewhere around 10 by 10 feet. We'll go ahead and measure it and talk about spacing in a moment. But what I grew here previously were cabbages and onions and leeks, which I still have going in the back. But primarily it was cabbages and cauliflowers, which are relatively heavy feeders. So what I did was to prep this area, I forked the ground with a digging fork, or you could use a broad fork if you have one handy. And then I sprinkled in some biotone and topped it all with some compost. Kept it very simple, incorporated some of that straw, but mostly I'm building the fertility here with that little bit of biotone and that compost layer. So that should be sufficient to actually feed these tomatoes for the season. Uh, in San Diego, one thing that is kind of interesting and something I'll talk a little bit about is that when you're growing tomatoes here, especially you could see the sky is totally gray right now, I could guarantee you that <laughs> every single one of these tomatoes is going to have powdery mildew probably within the next week or even two. So that's just something we have to accept here on the coast. And the way around it is that instead of just relying on these staying healthy forever and trying to spray them with fungicides or anything like that, just need to start a succession of tomatoes. So last week I started some more tomato seeds and this week I'm gonna be planting these tomatoes in the ground. So hopefully in the next month or two, those will start maturing and I'll be able to cycle in some new tomatoes for the ones that are the most diseased. So the plan here, just to give you a sense of the orientation is that that way is north, that way is south. So the ideal way to lay out these tomatoes to get the most sun is to be in parallel lines, roughly north-south. So that's what we're gonna be doing here, is I'm gonna have five tomatoes up front, five in the middle, and five in this back row. When these onions and leeks get harvested, I'll be able to actually throw in a whole nother row of tomatoes. That'll probably be a succession. So let's talk a little bit about spacing now and where I'm going to be putting all these different varieties in relation to this space. Now that we've talked a little bit about this area and how I've prepped it, let's talk a little bit about spacing and what my plan is here. So usually last year I did 18 inches between varieties or between tomatoes, I should say. But this year I wanna give them a little bit extra space. I'm gonna actually give them two feet. So 24 inches between each individual tomato plant in row. And the way I'm gonna start is by coming roughly a foot in from either direction on this bed. So this will be where the first tomato is one foot from this side, one foot from this side. And then the next tomato will be starting three feet from that one. Or when I say next tomato, the next row of tomatoes. So it'll be one row there of five, one row here of five, and then one more row of five back there. So here I'm gonna just check. I'm about exactly one foot away from the edge. So that's perfect. Now, what we wanna do is go two feet per each direction. But before I do that, because I'm actually gonna just dig those holes to make it a little simpler, let's talk about why I have these tomatoes on this side and those tomatoes back there. So the ones up front are the sort of classic slicing tomatoes. These are things like heirloom beef steaks, things like Brandywine, Cherokee Purple, German Pink, German Johnson, etc. Anything that produces a large fruit, I wanna have it front and center because that's gonna get the most sun no matter what. Even though I'm offsetting them and planting north-south, the tomatoes in the middle and the tomatoes in the back are gonna just get a little bit less sun. So the bigger the tomato, the more sun you need for it to actually produce fruit. So in that same reasoning, what I wanna do is in the back row is where I wanna put all my cherry tomatoes because they're going to still produce even if they get a little bit more shade from the tomatoes in front of them. And that's gonna ensure that overall, I have the best production I could possibly get. So let's go ahead and start digging out these holes. You could see that my <laughs> tomato transplants, since I waited so long, are almost two feet. So this one is 18 inches tall, which is a pretty hefty tomato. So we're gonna actually dig a substantial hole. You can see I've already removed the lower leaves on a lot of these. And so let's take a look. That's gonna be six inches plus the root ball, which is four inches. So we need, <laughs> we need to dig a 10 inch deep hole to plant these tomatoes. So I could do that with a trowel but I'm going to use the power planter instead to make my life easy. I'm gonna come through and drill out these 15 holes and we'll start dropping tomatoes in the ground. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the power planter because honestly with the no-till beds where I have layers of straw underneath, it could be kind of annoying to dig them out with the trowel. And also, like I just said, I need to dig a 10 inch deep hole 
And I could definitely do that with a trowel, but it's just gonna be so much faster with this. So from the tip to the top of this is about 12 inches. So I'm gonna stop somewhere on the second sort of spiral. So let's just go ahead and drill out these first five holes. The thing I like to see here is that the soil is nice and wet. So I actually had a sprinkler running here for a couple days to ensure that it was very deeply watered. And that'll make it very easy for me to plant these tomatoes deeply. And actually, I won't really need to water these for probably quite a while. I will water them a little bit in the first two weeks just to make sure they get established, but this is fantastic. It's gonna save me a ton of water in the long run. So let's go ahead and pop some of these tomatoes out and get them in the ground. So the five tomatoes I'm gonna have up here are sort of straight, classic, delicious beefsteaks. I'm gonna have the black creme. Uh, Brandywine, a wonderful classic I'm always going to grow. Marbone and Monero, which are those $15 tomato seed packets I got from Johnny's that I'm really excited about. And then I'm going to have the delicious Hunt. So let's start with those. I'm going to start popping them out of the cells and throwing some amendments in the ground. The amendments I'm going to put in the ground are the same that I pretty much do for everything, which is a nice scoop of warm castings and a smaller scoop of azomite or rock dust or glacial dust. So I'm gonna go grab that and we'll start planting these tomatoes. Each tomato is going to get a nice scoop of warm gold, maybe even a little bit more than that. The thing I like about warm gold is that it has the warm castings, which are great, but it also puts a little bit of that rock dust in there already and some kelp. So the thing that both those things do is they provide those trace minerals and elements that are sometimes hard to find in garden soil. So this is backfilled a little bit. Let's scoop that out. So we wanna give it a nice scoop. It's also nice because it's not really a straight fertilizer, so it's not gonna burn and harm your plants. Like if I put a big scoop of fertilizer, traditional organic fertilizer in the bottom, it might be a little too much for the tomatoes to handle and they won't like that. So we go with something light like warm castings. And then I'm gonna come through now and sprinkle a little bit of azomite. Just try not to overthink it, even though it looks like I'm overthinking it, <laughs> but I really like tomatoes. So I go a little bit extra with my tomatoes. I can't deny that. All right, so let's start with black creme. Important, I want the label. And since I only have one label, I'm going to keep the tray next to it so I don't forget what that other tomato is. I'll probably end up gifting the rest of these to friends and family. So I'm gonna take a look at this and choose the better of the two. They both look pretty good. I'm gonna go with this one here because it looks a little bit straighter. So I'm gonna just Push my finger on the bottom while gently tugging on the stem. And there you go. You got a nice, beautiful tomato. The thing about these cells is that they might look spiraled, but if you look at the edge, the, the roots are actually going down. So I'm not gonna mess with the root ball at all. It's perfectly healthy. It doesn't need to be broken up. And you can see just how deep that is. Let me do that one more time. So, boop. <laughs> and you can actually see one of these tomato flowers just fell off. And that's the thing with tomatoes is that I personally don't remove the flowers. If the tomato can't support it, it'll drop the flower by itself. You don't need to intervene. So I'm going to leave it. If it decides to drop them all, whatever, that's fine. But if it doesn't, that means I'm gonna have a tomato weeks earlier than I otherwise would. So when you plant this in, you wanna make sure that you firm it up nicely. I'm actually gonna leave a little well here. I don't wanna fully plant it because at the end, what we're gonna do is water these all in with a little bit of dilute fertilizer to give them that little bit of kickstart. So over here we have Brandywine. Again, I'm gonna choose the better of the bunch and I'll trim off this lower leaf. And the reason why, I'm sure that you've probably heard this a million times, but the reason why you plant tomatoes deeply is that any one of these parts of the tomato that's buried or touches soil can produce roots. So when you look at a tomato and it looks hairy, those hairs are potential roots. So once they get, you know, if you put them in a cup of water or if they get contact with soil, they'll actually root. So the deeper I plant it, the more roots it'll get and sort of the easier it's gonna to be to water and water manage these. So there's a brandy wine. And I guess these are old brandy wine. That can't be right. Oh no, I grabbed the wrong tag. That's my bad. So actually, this is kind of interesting here. So you see these two tomatoes, they have totally different leaves. I could have just confused myself since I grabbed the wrong tag. But if you look at the leaves here, this leaf is very large and that's called the potato leaf style. So tomatoes have different types of leaves. One of them is potato leaf style and they look like a potato plant. So I know that the brand new wine is a potato leaf variety. 
So with certainty, that's 100% brand new wine. You could tell that the other one next to it is different. It has these smaller serrated leaves. So I know for sure that that's the other tag, which is the Marbone. So let's grab that and throw it over here. All right, so this one's very nice and tall and the leaves are already gone, so I don't need to mess with it. Bury that in lightly. So that's Marbone. Come down here and we'll get in this delicious hunt. So this one I've already planted deeper. I ran out of four cells because just like you guys, I had to wait for those new ones to come out. So I'm gonna go ahead and snap off that leaf and this one only because it's hanging down. So it doesn't have that many leaves, but it has a nice big root ball. So that'll give it a good start. So these, when you have a normal pot, you have to kind of squeeze it. You can't just push it out from the bottom, but you can sort of force the bottom a little bit. Once you squish it enough, you should be able to just pull it right out. So here the roots are wrapping a little bit, but it's not bad enough that I'm gonna bother messing with it. I'm actually gonna just throw this in the ground. So the hole here is a little bit tighter, but I could just force it down. There we go. So that's delicious hunt. Just buried the tag. And the last tomato here will be the Marnero, the other $15 tomato. So that's the front row of beef steaks here. The next one is going to be mostly Bulgarian tomatoes. I can't tell you that much about them, but in a month or two when I start harvesting from them, I'll definitely be talking about them a lot more and I'll tell you if they're worth it and if they worked. So I'm gonna go ahead and just plant those out and then we'll talk a little bit about the cherries at the end. The cherry tomatoes are in the ground. The varieties that I have this year are Sunrise Bumblebee, Lucky Tiger, Sun Gold, Brandywine Cherry, which I'm really excited about. Apparently it tastes like a Brandywine heirloom tomato but in the cherry form. And the last one here is the Husky Cherry. If, if you want a tomato that's like very <laughs> low maintenance and can withstand a lot of disease pressure, heat, drought, and make tasty tomatoes, the Husky Cherry is the one for you. We always have it every year just because it's so delicious and it could just keep growing through any disease or stress. It's kind of crazy. So the next thing, like I mentioned, that we want to do is actually water these in a little bit with some fertilizer. So what I have here is the Agro Thrive fruit and flower mix. So this is more geared towards 335. So that last two, the last two digits, the P and the K, are more for rooting and fruiting. And that's what you want for something like a tomato plant. So I've been using Agro Thrive for about two years now. You can see I've bought this bottle a long time ago <laughs> because the label is a little bit faded. But so it says for starter plants, you wanna do two ounces of fertilizer in a gallon every week. For mature plants, four ounces. These are a little bit in between both. For now, since I have plenty of fertility, I'm just gonna go ahead and do two ounces. Kind of smells like soy sauce, but also like something that you don't wanna eat at the same time. <laughs> That's the best way I could describe it. So water this in. And what I'm gonna do now is go to every one of these plant holes, pour a little bit in, and then do that again until the can's empty. And then we're gonna talk about interplanting and finish it with a trellis build on these tomatoes. And I'm actually gonna splash a little bit on the tomato itself so they could feed off of that. But then I'll come back and spray everything down with a hose too, because I don't want it sitting on it too much. What you see before me are a couple different interplanting or companion plants for tomatoes. And I'll talk a little bit about why I like using these ones, but there's dozens of other options, so don't feel like you have to do these. So the first one up is the sweet alism. Um, or lysum. And the thing that's great about this is it attracts a lot of these beneficial wasps that parasitize things like tomato hornworms. And they also will just bring in pollinators in general to help pollinate your tomatoes. So we'll definitely be putting in a bunch of those. I'm going to be sprinkling in a couple dill plants in the front here. Dill is another great thing for bringing in beneficial insects and it's also just something that's nice with tomatoes. So having it nearby is very handy. The next one is marigold. The marigolds honestly just kind of add a pop of color and they might help attract some pollinators. There's some limited impact on things like grubs and deterring grubs from getting around your plant roots. So I'm gonna go ahead and do those. And the last one, absolute classic. Mine are still too small to transplant out. So I went to a nursery and bought a six pack. This is Genovese type basil, a wonderful basil for making tomato sauce or fresh tomato salads. So I'm definitely gonna be putting in a few of those, but I'm gonna just kind of sprinkle in all these different plants in between all these tomatoes right now. It's day two of planting tomatoes in ground. 
And you might notice that there are a few changes around me. In particular, there's all these structures in, T-posts, and some weird thing back there. So the weird thing back there is kind of an experimental trellis that I did record, but just in case it doesn't work, I, want, I don't want to give you guys that information and have it fail on you. So we'll be checking in on that later in the season, and I'll definitely share how that works. But today we need to talk about how to actually install some T-posts and do a Florida weave tomato trellis. So let's go ahead and get right into that. Before I hammer in this final T-post and talk about the Florida weave structure, let's go over why the T-post is such a great tool. This one here is an eight foot T-post, which means that by the time I hammer it in, I'm going to have about six feet of effect effective vertical height to support my tomatoes. The thing that's really great about T-posts is these little bumps here, because they act as natural locks for the string. So as the tomatoes start pushing down on the string, like you see behind me, it's going to want to slide down the post, but these little bumps stop it from doing that. The other thing that's great is that it has this little fin down here. And what that does is it makes it a very good anchor in the soil. So once it's hammered in, it's very unlikely to go A, pop out of the hole or B, lean over too much. But we do have a trick to help counter that lean from the tomato weight. So I'm gonna show you that right now by hammering this post in. So a couple things to note when you're hammering your T-post in. The first one is, is that you want these bumps facing away from your tomato plants. The second thing you want to do is make sure that to the best of your ability, it's in a relatively straight line with your tomato plants and with your other T-posts. This will help make your weave more organized and I'm going to start by pushing it in lightly as much as I can to reduce the amount of hammering. So this might be a little bit scary, but just remember that as this sits in, in the ground over time, the ground is gonna get compacted, it's gonna get wet, and the T-post will rust a little bit, expand, and it's gonna lock into place. So it might seem a little bit scary at first that it's going in so easy, but it will firm itself up over time. The other thing you probably just noticed is that I didn't put this T-post in straight in. I put it out at a slant away from the plants. This is because as the plants grow heavy, they're gonna to wanna to pull this T-post in towards the plants. So by biasing it out a little bit, we're actually buying ourselves a lot of repair to the structure over time, because eventually this will end up being pretty close to vertical with all the weight of the tomatoes. An important note for installing a full Florida weave or basket weave trellis system is that you do want your two outer posts to be angled away, but every second or third tomato, you also need a vertical post. This vertical post is what stops the whole system from flopping over one way or another, and it adds a lot of rigidity to the system in general. It gives you an ability to tie up slack and tighten up the whole system overall. If you could get away with it, it's best if you do it every two plants. Uh, in this case, I have five plants in row, so I have two plants, post, three plants, post. But again, two or three plants, totally fine. You don't wanna go any longer than that because then you're gonna start having a very floppy system and you're probably going to think, wow, this system sucks, it's not working very well. You just need to make sure you have enough supports. So now we're at the critical point of tying up these tomatoes in the true basket or Florida weave. I wanted to quickly mention a couple different options. This is cotton butcher's twine. I'm testing it out this year. Right behind me, that's what's being used right now. But the normal standard is a poly twine or tomato twine. It's a nylon plastic sort of twine. I'm not crazy about it since it's plastic, but I wanted to try it to see if it holds up any better to be significantly better than something like a natural material such as cotton. The one thing that I will say is that I have used jute or sisal twine in the past, and I found it to be so rough that it scratched up the tomatoes and increased the disease prevalence. So that's why I'm going for something soft like cotton and something less scratchy like this poly twine here. So let's get into actually how to tie these up right now. So to start our weave, what we're going to do first is actually go to the end of our T-post in between two of those bumps. I'm going to tie a double or triple knot. The only thing that matters about this knot is that whatever it is, you don't want it to slip. I'm already <laughs> finding this uh, poly twine to be pretty annoying because it has, it's not really bound together. But let's go ahead and try it out. The idea behind the Florida or basket weave is that you're creating a basket around your tomatoes. So as I start here, tied off to the post, and I approach the first tomato, I have to either go in front of it or behind it. So I'm gonna go behind, and then when you get to the next tomato, you're gonna go in front. So what you're seeing already is that I'm starting to entrap them in alternating strokes. So this is behind, in front, behind. I'm gonna come around here, and I'm going to wrap it around the post, around the same height, and I wanna wrap it around 
two to three times. The reason why you're wrapping it is because you want to pull some tension on this line here. And by overlapping the string, as you wrap around the post, the string is now locking onto itself. So that's the beauty of that center post. It helps tie up some of that slack. So now this tomato originally went behind, so I'm gonna go in front of it now. And this tomato was in front, so I'm gonna go behind. And you probably get the picture, this one was behind, so I'm going in front. Now as I approach the T post, I wanna pull out some slack, get something to cut it with. And I'm, see here, I'm l leaving it loose, but the other string is still tight because it's wrapped around that other post. Now as I pull this tight, all the tomatoes respond by standing more upright. So I'm gonna pull this tight. Once again, I'm gonna wrap it around the post two times. And then I'm going to tie the string to itself, like that return string that I just wrapped around. And I'm gonna do a double knot there. <laughs> yeah, it's polytwine. The little ends are all frayed. And I could tell this works really well because it's holding onto itself but it's a little bit annoying to deal with all these little frayed bits. Now the last thing I like to do is I take the original line that I tied off with and the line that I finished with and I tie those two together. The idea behind this is that now the whole line can't slip because they're mated to each other at this knot. So this whole system has created a basket that the tomatoes are now sitting in. So if I push it one way or another, all the tomatoes are moving in unison, and that's why you want that center post. If you didn't have that center post, and I had five tomatoes all in a line, this could get very floppy very fast. So now that you saw the setup for a single set of tomatoes, let's do the full run to show you exactly how that works. When you're doing a Florida weave system, you're gonna wanna do this tie up every six to eight to 10 inches maybe. If you do it every foot, you can get away with that, but you're starting to get into dangerous territory there. <laughs> Uh, speaking from personal experience. And what happens is that you're gonna end up having too much tomato to support at once, and it's gonna get a little bit floppy on you. But the nice thing about the Florida weave system is that it's very forgiving in those circumstances, and you can still get away with it. After about a month of growth, I'll do an update about how to prune and support the whole structure as it continues to grow through the season. So stay tuned for that one in the future. Now let's do a full run of the tomato Florida weave. What you'll see is that I didn't go a very large step up because these tomatoes are so small that at this point they don't really need more than a single string. So I'm going to try to split the difference and get a little bit of height here so I could grab all those. But the basic principle is going to remain the same. So I'm tied off to the post between two bumps. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come behind this tomato, go in front of this tomato, hit my post, and actually I'm gonna try to cheat it and go a little bit higher there. So you'll see, once again, I have the slack. I wanna pull the slack and get as much tension in that line as I can. Then I'm gonna wrap it three times to make sure that, that string is locked onto itself. This will, a lot of people complain about the Florida weave slipping tension over time, but if you wrap your string two to three times like this, it's not gonna happen. So keep that in mind. So now on that previous tomato, I went in front. So on this one, I'm gonna go behind. And on this one, I'm gonna go in front. And then on this one, I'll go behind. So keep in mind also when you hit a uh, flower cluster that you don't put the string right up against the cluster unless you're okay with losing that cluster because the string might break it since those flower cluster stems tend to be a little bit more fragile. So again, I wrapped it three times to lock the string. And then now I'm gonna do the opposite. So in front, behind, and in front. Hit the post again, and we're gonna wrap it three times. If you're feeling confident, you can get away with just a double wrap, but especially at the beginning, when we're setting up this first establishing wrap, I like to make sure that I do the three. So then come back again, go behind, and go in front. So here I have a flower cluster. I'm gonna try to be careful and get right underneath it. And then now that I'm at my post, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it, pull the slack in, and give it three wraps. At this point, I could actually just cut it, make my life a little bit easier to finish these wraps. And now actually, let me bring the camera in a little bit closer to show you how I tie off this final knot. All right, so let's do this final triple wrap. 
And then this is the return line, the string that I just brought over. So I'm going to take my end of the rope here, and I'm going to do a single overhand knot while trying to keep some tension. That's why I held on to that string. So you can see there's a single knot right here. We're going to come back through and tie one more knot so that it's a double. Just like that. So now this is nice and tight. And the final bit of insurance that I like to do is I take the original piece of string and I tie it to that final return line. So let's go ahead and do that. This, like I mentioned, prevents the whole thing from slipping because they're now mated to each other. And it's effectively a single piece of string. It has nowhere to go. I'm gonna just keep tying knots because I'm feeling a little bit paranoid. There we go. So now I have three knots and this whole thing is entirely taut and now supporting these tomatoes. Let's do a quick pan and talk about the next steps. So here's the basket weave in action. You can see all the tomatoes are moving together. So now this whole field of tomatoes is fully supported, but as the season progresses, they'll start developing suckers, they'll start developing a lot of foliage, and we're going to talk about how to support all that and prune all of that in a future video. The only thing left for me to do here today is to actually add a bunch of straw mulch, just like I have back there, fully mulch this area out, give it one more water, and I don't think I actually need to water this for probably a month because of how wet the soil is deep down below, like I showed you guys. So stay tuned for those future pruning updates, and I'll catch you guys next time.